15 minute or less lecture series in adding physiology, chapter 7, the skeletal system, part 1. Bones are very active living tissue, and each bone is in itself an organ because an organ has two or more different kinds of tissue. In the case of bone, you have the bone tissue, cartilage, dense connective tissue, blood, nervous tissue. The bones function to be attachment sites for muscles. That's one of their key functions, which then, of course, allows movement by the muscles. Uh, the bones uh, are protective and are able to protect and support soft underlining tissues, such as the hard skull around the brain to keep that safe. Uh, blood, bone also functions in blood cell production. All blood cells are produced in the red bone marrow. And bones also store inorganic salts, especially calcium. Bones come in four kinds of classifications. You have long bones, as shown here, that are much longer than they are wide. You have short bones that are about as wide as they are long. You have irregular bones that, well, have an odd shape to them. And then you have flat bones that are relatively thin. If you look at the uh, inner workings of a long bone, you see that it has two epiphyses, a proximal epiphysis at one end, a distal epiphysis at the other end. And between them lies the diaphysis, or shaft. You also find that within the epiphyses are epiphyseal plates in a child or epiphyseal lines in an adult. The bone tissue found near the inside at the ends is spongy bone tissue. Looks kind of like a sponge with lots of empty space that might be filled with red bone marrow. And then on the outside, everywhere around the bone, is compact bone tissue. Very dense, very protective, and thicker in the areas where there's an open space. Within the spongy bone is the red bone marrow that produces all blood cells. Within the diaphysis, you have this open space called a medullary cavity. And within the medullary cavity is yellow bone marrow, which is a site where triglycerides or fats are stored. At the ends of the bone, where the uh, bones are smooth and form joints, is the articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage, so it ends as well down here. And as I mentioned before, children will have epiphyseal plates here and here. Epiphyseal plates are made of hyaline cartilage. It's where bone growth occurs for length. As for dense connective tissue, wrapped around the outside of the bone, where you do not have articular cartilage, is the periosteum, made of dense connective tissue. And then lining the inside and going all around the bone tissue, where all these uh, nooks and crannies are, is the endosteum, also dense connective tissue. Here's a wedge of bone, the periosteum on the outside, primarily compact bone tissue with a little bit of spongy bone tissue before you get to the medullary cavity. Uh, compact bone tissue has this reoccurring structure called the osteon. The osteon looks kind of like the rings of a tree or a dartboard. And at the very center is a open space called the central canal where blood vessels and nerves are found. You can see central canals go up and down the length of the bone. If you look closer, you also can see there are little pockets within the dense connective tissue called lacuna for one, lacuna for many, and in each lacuna is an osteocyte or bone cell. And then there's these little tunnels called caniculi for many, caniculus for one, that connect the various lacuna to the central canal. You also can find perforating canals going along the width of the bone structure, also filled with blood vessels and nerves. The spongy bone, all its little girders, are referred to as trabecula for one, trabeculi for many. Uh, there are uh, three different cells that are very important for bone tissue. There are the osteoblasts. These bone cells build up the bone matrix, the organic material in the bone, and then that matrix becomes calcified, collects calcium salts. So osteoblasts build up bone tissue. You also have osteoclasts. They break down the bony matrix. They break down the organic material, releasing the calcium. So you can say osteoclasts cut down or cleave the bone tissue. And then, should any osteoblast get uh, trapped in lacuna inside of the bone tissue, then they will turn into osteocytes. And the osteocytes function is to help maintain the health of the bone tissue. And this process of building up 
The bone and breaking it down occurs all the time everywhere in our body and is referred to as bone remodeling. Intramembranous bones are the flat bones found in the skull. These bones go through the intramembranous process of formation. They start off as a sheet of embryonic connective tissue and then different locations inside of the sheet, the cells will start to become osteoblasts. The osteoblasts will then deposit the bony matrix and that will become calcified through a process called ossification. Within that calcified tissue, there will be some osteocytes that will form that are trapped in the tissue. Over time, the tissue will begin to spread throughout the embryonic connective tissue, forming what looks kind of like spongy bone tissue. And blood vessels will begin to be incorporated into this. And then eventually, the bone tissue will remodel sufficiently to give us the compact bone tissue on the outside with the spongy bone tissue on the inside and the final formation of those flat bones. All the rest of the bones of the body are called endochondrial bones. They form through the endochondrial ossification process. All the bones start off as an embryo in the form of a hyaline cartilage model that are basically in the right place, look kind of like the bone. Over time, uh, areas within the center of the model will begin to develop ossification centers. We'll begin to calcify the tissue as osteoblasts are formed. The calcified tissue will continue to spread and be remodeled to look like the bony tissue we would expect in the diaphysis. Blood vessels will be incorporated, medullary cavity will start to form. Eventually, there will be secondary ossification centers forming in the proximal and distal epiphyses calcifying those ends of the bone tissue as well. Uh, then the fetus will be born as an infant with bones that are a little more flexible, have a lot more cartilage than expected as the infant develops and grows older. Uh, eventually you'll get the formation expected for a child with the epithelial plates made of hyaline cartilage where bone length growth will occur. And of course the hyaline cartilage forming the articular cartilage at the smooth ends. And finally you get the adult bone tissue where the epithelial plates have become calcified, become epithelial lines. There's no more growth in length, but the articular cartilage will remain. Red bone marrow occupies the spongy bone areas of the skull, the ribs, sternum, clavicle, vertebra, etc., and they produce all of the blood cells, the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, through a process called hematopoiesis. And red bone marrow is red because the pigment protein hemoglobin, which carries oxygen, is also red. Calcium homeostasis. Turns out bones are important in regulating the amount of calcium in our blood, which needs to be at a very certain set point at a very specific level. Now, should the calcium levels in the blood get too high, this will trigger receptors that detect this uh, information in the thyroid gland. The receptors will then cause the thyroid gland to secrete the hormone calcitonin. Calcitonin will be released into the bloodstream and will eventually affect the osteoblasts, causing the osteoblasts to build up more organic bone matrix material. And as it builds up the bone, calcium is removed from the bloodstream to calcify that bone tissue, eventually returning our blood levels to normal levels for calcium. And if we have the other extreme, the calcium levels get too low in the bloodstream, then this will be detected by receptors in the parathyroid glands. They will then detect the low levels of calcium and trigger the release of the parathyroid hormones. They will enter the bloodstream, finally making it to the osteoclasts of the bones. The osteoclasts will then increase the amount of bone tissue they break down. This breaking down of the organic material will cause calcium to enter the bloodstream eventually returning the blood levels of calcium to the normal amount. Again, negative feedback mechanism. There's a stimulus that we want to change and return back to the normal level, either with calcitonin if it's too high or parathyroid hormone if it's too low. The bones act as levers. They are rigid structures that resist the forces of the muscles that pull on them, leading to movement at the fulcrum, which in our body is called the joint. Fractures. Sometimes our bones can break. You can have stress fractures, which are microscopic, pathological fractures from diseases, 
You can have green stick fractures, where there's an incomplete fracture and the bone bends a little. Fissured fractures that go up the bone but don't actually shatter into pieces. Versus comminuted fractures, where the bone actually gets shattered into pieces. Uh, transverse fracture, where it goes clear across the bone. This is a pretty easy one to heal. An oblique fracture, which goes at an angle along the bone. And then a spiral fracture, which spirals up the bone, potentially all the way to the other end, and is very difficult to heal. If you suffer a fracture, the first thing that happens is blood will escape from the broken blood vessels, forming the hematoma, the blood giant blood clot. Over time, this blood clot will be replaced with a fibrocartilage callus, called a soft callus. Over time, that fibrocartilage callus will be replaced by spongy bone tissue called a hard callus, and eventually that will be remodeled to give us the expected structure of that portion of the bone. There are 206 bones in the body. They are breaking down into the axial skeleton, which are all the bones that run along the midline, and the appendicular skeleton, which is the limbs, the bones of the limbs, and the structures that attach the limbs to the axial skeleton. There are various markings you'll see over and over again. There are rough attachment sites for ligaments and tendons, such as trochanters on the femur, or the ramus or arm, processes that stick out, tubercles, tuberosities, epicondyles, subcondyles, crests with long ridges, spines with partial stick out, lines that are small ridges, uh, smooth areas for forming joints, such as heads of some bones. Hind dials, facets, which are nice and flat. These are all, again, very smooth, covered in articular cartilage. Uh, depressions and grooves, the alveolus, which is sockets for the teeth, uh, sulcus, which is a groove along the surface of the bone, a fossa, which is a depression, uh, and spaces that allow things to pass through the bone, sinuses inside some bones, canals, uh, fissures, which are long and jagged, foramens, which are holes. The appendicular skeleton includes the uh, pectoral girdle, which consists of the clavicle and the scapula, which attaches the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. The scapula has a long spine on its posterior side that ends in a acromion process. Here's the acromion process again. It also has a uh, socket referred to as the glenoid cavity, where it articulates with the humerus. Here's the humerus. It has the head that fits into the glenoid cavity, a greater tubercle and a, and a lesser tubercle, rough patches on its uh, proximal portion, a roughened area called the deltoid tuberosity, the lateral and medial epicondyles. Note the head always goes pieces in medially. And then, of course, at the distal end, you have these smooth rounded areas, the capitulum on the lateral side, the trochlea on the medial side, and then the corona fossa on the anterior side and the olecranon fossa on the posterior side. The humerus attaches to the ulna and radius at the elbow joint. The radius has a head at the proximal end and a scalary process at the distal end. The ulna has the olecranon process sticking out back posteriorly. The trochlear notch that surrounds the humerus. Coronoid process at the proximal end and the distal end, a styloid process. This brings us to the hand with the eight carpals at the wrist, five metacarpals at the palm, and the 14 phalanges, only two in the thumb. Then the pelvic girdle, which is the hip bones or oscoxes that attach the lower legs to the axial skeleton, aka the sacrum. And the pelvic cavity is formed by the sacrum, the coccyx, and parts of the hip bones. Hip bones or oscoxes have three main parts the ilium, the pubis, the ischium. There's a socket called the acetabulum and a hole called the obturator foramen. It has an iliac crest that ends with the anterior superior iliac spine and a rough patch near the bottom called the ischial porosity. Uh, the pubic symphysis is a piece of fibrocartilage that connects the two oscoxi. Females have a large or wider pubic arch than males, and males have a more narrow uh, curvature in that location. The femur has a head that fits into the acetabulum, a greater trochanter and lesser trochanter, the distal in a lateral condyle, and a medial condyle. Patella also is part of the knee joint, femur, patella, tibia. Tibia has two lateral, lateral medial condyles, the tibial tuberosity attached to the patellar ligament at the distal end and medial malleolus. The fibula, which is lateral, has a lateral malleolus. Then you have the seven tarsals of the ankle, the five metatarsals of the foot, and the 14 phalanges, only two in the great toe. And that's it.